Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Luke McDonald. I spent most of my life in suburban Chicagoland in a predominantly white context, and I've spent the last year in this amazing predominantly African-American church in Inglewood, California. And even before any of this crazy moment in our world, what some are calling a second civil rights movement unfolded, I've been studying and preparing this lecture, which is a race in the church, a white perspective for white evangelicals. It's really important that I underscore that these are my perspectives and understandings and if you want to have a full understanding, you need to get people of color from a variety, male and female, additional backgrounds. But this is my attempt to try to help along the way. And so here's what I want to try to do in this message. I want to try to help along this biblical ideal. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul makes it clear that because of what Jesus has done, he broke down the dividing wall of hostility. And although that still exists so often in our world between red and blue, black and white, male and female, because of what Jesus has done, we have the ability, if we learn his principles and believe in him fully and completely and grow our understanding of each other, we have the ability to not continually rebuild, like so often happens, the wall of hostility that Christ has already torn down. And so what I want to do in this talk is I want to do three things. I want to try to first explain how we got here, both in culture and in the church. I want to try to explain why it's so hard to fix it. Why is it that there's so many people that want better race relations, but yet we don't have it yet? And then I want to try to bring a few suggested solutions. So here we go. How do we get here in America? How do we get to this moment where a nation that is known as the land of the free and the home of the brave has people protesting in all 50 states in every major city an uprising of sorts along this idea what's the main thing in their mouth no justice no peace justice for george floyd justice for brianna taylor justice for ahmed arbery what is this thing what how did we get here into this black lives matter moment we got here a few ways of course, the thing that most people understand is slavery. For several hundred years before even America was its own country and until the Civil War, slavery, where people were allowed to generate income by using free labor on the backs of other people, predominantly African Americans, that's how we got here. And a lot of people have this misconception that when slavery ended, Racism ended. When slavery ended, discrimination ended. But in many ways, an even more evil, because it's more hidden and clever, era that came next was the Jim Crow era that was from the end of the Civil War all the way up until the Civil Rights Movement was a systematic grouping of laws that although slavery was no longer legal, kept people of color down. There's many ways to understand that and, and lots of resources that you can find, but simply said, that era didn't solve the problem of racism. And then there's the civil rights. And I grew up uh, in the 90s, and people who grew up in my era, the millennial generation, many of us were taught as we were growing up that racism was gone, that racial problems, we were living in like a post-racial society because people thought that better laws could make better hearts. And they did make things better in some ways, but in many other ways, it just pushed the racism in people's hearts into more clever and more underground ways of bringing them to the surface. You see, a couple things must be understood. The first one is this. Systemic injustice breeds systemic distrust. So the reason why you have people in the streets clamoring for defund the police, the reason why you have people screaming for we need to break the whole thing down, is people are tired of hearing this, it's just a few bad apples. It's just a few isolated incidents. It's just a few people out there. Many people have come to the conclusion that the entire system must be destroyed because the entire system is rancid. The first and most notable way that comes out right now is in people's opinions of law enforcement. You see these videos of police killing unarmed black men and women and I could list you all the names I listed a few a moment ago in almost every circumstance you can find imaginable. But in each case, there's this question, how did this happen? How could this happen again? Will there be any sense of justice? And how could any punishment bring the person who's gone back? It leads people who are living under this regime to a place of distrusting the whole system. Also, the criminal justice system. Uh, if you've seen the movie or read the book Just Mercy, that you might be familiar with the work of Brian Stevenson. But it's 
this idea that there is a systemic problem with the way our criminal justice system works. One really simple way, one example of way of understanding it, is the war on drugs. The war on drugs was designed to try to solve the drug problem in America, but it penalized in very racially unfair ways. Powder cocaine was more of a white and suburban drug, crack cocaine more of an urban drug, and although they're the same drug and cause the same problems in people, you'd be shocked to find out that crack cocaine was punished at 100 times the rate of powder cocaine. People look at a thing like that and they say, well, we've decided different penalties for different people because some people are more important than other people. Systemic injustice breeds systemic distrust. Uh, education funding is another place where you see this. Most public schools in America, their funding comes from their property taxes. Property taxes come from housing values. And what that produces is nicer areas get higher taxes, get better schools. If you divide, this is a way of showing the injustice in education funding. If you divide the stratas of economic status into five groups, the top 20% in predominantly white suburban areas, receives on average $4,100 more in education funding than the bottom. We say that we're a nation of just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, just work hard, do the right thing, Protestant work ethic, and you can get to the top. But the way that we sort things out actually is that the people who are already on top get more funding, better programs, and thus better outcomes. It's not a few bad apples, it's a systemic problem. And then the fourth example of systemic distrust come on because of systemic injustice is housing access. Uh, if you've never heard this term before, this is something you should learn about. It's called redlining. Back into the 1930s, uh, governments came up with clever ways of making sure that people they didn't want to make it into certain neighborhoods couldn't make it into certain neighborhoods. In that era, they were, you can actually find it in documents. What can we do to keep only Northern European descendants in this neighborhood? And what that produced was the nicer areas got better and appreciated more over time, while the poorer areas stayed poorer. Amazingly, 100 years ago, if you looked at the most undesirable neighborhoods in a given city in America, 91% of those neighborhoods are still the most undesirable 100 years later. So what happened in this systemic injustice is that home appreciation, housing value, is the primary way that middle class people accumulate wealth. And the system was rigged so that only certain people were able to accumulate this wealth. But yet we say, Protestant work ethic, lift yourselves up by your bootstraps, just work hard and you'll get what you want. But we see that there is a systemic distrust in America because of a systemic injustice. But sadly, the church is no better. How did we get here in the church? This is a famous quote from Martin Luther King Jr. where he describes that you don't find the most segregation in hospitals or schools or places like that. No, the church hour, 11 o'clock, Sunday morning, that's the time when segregation is at its highest. The church is no better. In fact, in many ways, the church has lagged behind the government in a true sense of racial and ethnic justice. There's a few reasons for that. One of them is white Jesus. Uh, this picture is more than the Mona Lisa, more than the Last Supper, more than American Gothic. This picture, Head of Christ by Warner Salmon, painted in 1930s, is the most reproduced picture of all time. Over 500 million wallet-sized pictures like this were passed out to people in the last 100 years. And what happened over time is people started to take on the idea that, well, look, Jesus, there he is, white-skinned. And over time, people began to think that Jesus was a white god for white people. Of course, just a momentary analysis of what Jesus probably looked like leads us to the conclusion that Jesus wasn't European. He was from the Middle East. He looked like undoubtedly the people in his area. But this was used, this white Jesus thing, kind of produces over time this idea of whiteness or white hegemony. You can read this quote from Corey Edwards, but it's this idea that people take on over time that because white culture is the 
primary culture, the leading culture, the powerful culture. It should be that way. And what they do is the right thing and the normal thing. One of the ways that we got here, this racial moment in the church, is by taking on this idea of whiteness. Whiteness is the idea that whites are dominant, they're right, and white culture is what's normal culture. You can find a hundred different ways that this plays out, but it makes a huge impact. It's that the way that white people think and act and do things, what's normal in their culture is what's normal in society. And so it's been hard to fix it. It's simply, that's our second section, it's very, very hard to fix this problem, racial tension in the church. Not all people's hearts are bad, not all of their desires are wrong, but we haven't been able to fix it yet. Why? Well, for one, over time, people have started to think that being a Christian means you vote the same. This startled me when I came to this realization. 2016 presidential election, over 80% of people who would define themselves as a white evangelical voted for President Trump. Only 8% of African Americans voted for President Trump, which means, if you look at the way political scientists divide people into different subgroups, the people most likely to vote for President Trump of any subgroup were white evangelicals, and those least likely to vote for him were African Americans. So when you look at it through that lens in our politically charged time, should we really be so surprised that people on the farthest ends of the spectrum are struggling to see eye to eye or to align, even though they would say, many of them, that their faith is the most important thing about them? Many people, sadly, have fallen into the trap of believing that their identity, politically or racially, is the most important thing about them, even more than their faith. Also, the white church has had a long track record of passivity. Uh, this is Billy Graham and Martin Luther King Jr. They were aligned. Billy Graham had integrated crusades, but he also was a loud voice for conservative patience, not too much, too fast, against demanding justice. Proof is in many quotes and many stories. The church has typically been, at best, moderate saying, yes, we agree with you, but not too much, not too fast. Let's not upset the apple cart, making it clear that the white church has often preferred their position of power to truly trying to help those who need and are seeking justice. It makes it hard to fix it, this track record of passivity. Third, the white church has a massive economy. There is a huge world of commerce associated with books written for, music produced for, stores that cater to, curriculums. And there's a massive economy that the white church has propelled forward. And it has made many people who are outside of that system feel as though my only choice is if I want to write a book, make an album. If I want to make it forward in that, I must conform to the expectations of the white church economy if I want to get ahead. And then the white church is known for theological arrogance. There's many evangelical organizations that have tended to police and fix rather than understand and celebrate black church culture. This picture is of a conference that I helped put together uh, about a decade ago. And the idea of the conference, it was called the Elephant Room, and the idea of the conference was to try to help people from different spheres of Christianity who don't normally get together, get together. We were honored that Bishop T.D. Jakes came and was part of the conference that I helped lead. And we received an unbelievable amount of push from white theological leaders that we should not have him or that we should uninvite him. And you know what we were told? We were told his theology preys upon the black community. It, it, it hurts, not helps. Just think about the arrogance of a group of white theologians saying that one of the leading black pastors of the day that we must protect the black community from one of their own pastors because he is teaching them someone wrong. It's this idea that somehow the white evangelical church is allowed to police everybody. What we believe is right is right because we believe it's right. That's what makes it hard to fix. And then the last reason why it's hard to fix is nobody enjoys being treated like a people. This is a well-known uh, Southern Baptist pastor and this is Eminem. Both of these people are white. They are very different. No one would look at those two people and think, well, they probably have the same values. They probably have the same thoughts. They probably have the same vocabulary. But amazingly enough, 
Many of us fall into the trap, white culture especially, of assuming that people that aren't like us are all alike. We assume that, well, sure, I'm really different than the people close to me, but those people from that country, those people from that background, those people from that place, well, they all must think the same. It's hard to fix the problems of race in our world because we often assume that the one person we know or the one person we've talked to is a representative of an entire group, not realizing that there are as many perspectives as there are people. So here's a few uh, suggested solutions. You've made it now through a lot of minutes of what didn't feel like super good news, so now let me try to bring you a little bit of good news. First, we must come to a place of understanding the difference between race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity are two different things. You see, ethnicity is giving meaning to culture, but race is giving meaning to physical characteristics. You see, ethnicity is about using culture to establish group identity, a sense of we, but race is about establishing someone else's worth and capacity. This may seem like an unimportant distinction, but it is actually very important. You see, what does a person who happens to have white skin from Scotland and Poland have in common? Well, almost nothing by way of ethnicity, but a lot by way of this idea, this social construct of race. What does a person who spent their whole life in LA and a person who spent their whole life in Jamaica have in common in terms of ethnicity? Well, probably not very much, but people may assume they're the same race. Ethnicities are something beautiful to be celebrated. But this idea that people who look alike must be alike, think alike, act alike, that is something that must be understood and subtly and cleverly and purposely torn away. You see, one of the things that we must understand as we're trying to solve is that you can't solve uh, feelings problems with facts. This is Ahmad Arbery. He was killed a few months ago in an unnecessary, unreasonably tri- criminal and tragic way. And the news cycle always works the same. This video comes out and you see this ridiculous event and people rise up and say, how can this happen? This, there must be justice. And then there's always this way that the media tries to make it seem like the person deserved it or it was justified. Do you remember this? That there, a video came up that showed Ahmad wandering into a house that was in the process of being built. I've done that dozens of times. I don't know if that's technically considered trespassing. It certainly isn't on my account. But somehow there was this idea pushed out of the media. Well, yeah, if he was doing this, well, of course it makes sense that he was shot. And we have this terrible tendency to think that if we just sort of lift up, and notice that the word facts on this slide is in quotes, if we can just sort of lift up facts, then that's going to solve the problem that is at core a problem of feeling. You see, the difference between me and many friends that I have who don't look like me black friends, when they see one of these videos is, I see this video and I think that's horrible. But someone who I've met, friends who don't look like me, see that video and think that could be me. That could be my son. That could be my brother, my uncle. I don't have the ability to feel what it feels like that that could be me. And so I can't simply rush at people who feel like that and say, well, but there's only a few isolated incidents. There's, do you know about this? What about this? What about this? That's trying to solve a feeling problem with facts, some of which could be true and some of which may not be. But you can't solve a feeling problem with facts. Because people don't care what you know until they know that you care. One of the reasons why there's such a toxicity in the social media realm and as people are trying to talk about these racial issues is they try to tell someone a bunch of things before establishing any commonality or relationship. I've always thought it noteworthy that Jesus, if you look at the Gospels, goes out of his way over and over and over and over. When he meets the woman at the well, he doesn't start with, you have five husbands. When Peter denies him, he doesn't rush to condemn him. Jesus always starts from a place of establishing commonality and relationship before he moves to challenging a person's thinking or assumptions. Here's three unhelpful questions that a lot of my white brothers and sisters tend to ask that tend to make things worse and not better. 
First, there's the what about question. You always hear this one. What about, what about this? Oh, what about this? What about abortion? What about black on black crime? What about this? What about this? What about this? What about LeBron James? He's rich and successful. How bad could it really be? What about, what about, what about, what about? And you're never helping someone that you claim to care about by talking about something else rather than the thing they want to talk about. And most of those issues, if you take the time to study them or understand them, have really great answers. That is unhelpful to try the what about game. You'll also hear people say, well, what did I do wrong? I, I didn't grow up on a plantation. I don't, didn't receive any economic benefit. I, people will say, I don't see color, or they'll say, I don't, I'm not really part of this. What did I do wrong? We'll get to that one in a second. And then there's the, why can't we just move on? You ever hear people say things like that? Yeah, I mean, I get it, I get it. There was a lot of bad stuff in the past, but why can't we just go on a fresh page and go forward? These are unhelpful questions. If we want to actually fix it, if we want to actually move forward, if we want to make things better, these are questions that we should stop asking. You see, individualistic majorities struggle to understand communal minorities. This is, there's a massive difference in the way that groups of people think. It's beautifully described by an African theologian, Desmond Tutu, when he talks about this concept of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a theological idea that says, I am because you are. Differently said, it's, there's no way for me to thrive or to flourish unless you are also thriving and flourishing. It's an idea that views all of us together as inherently necessary for society to move forward in a positive way. That is not the way that the white, evangelical, often suburban mindset is set up. It's take care of you, take care of me, take care of our family, but everybody on their own. And interestingly enough, in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul talks about both of these things. In this famous passage, the Apostle Paul talks about the importance of bearing one another's burdens and also says each one will have to bear his own load. These ideas of you need to take care of yourself and we all need to take care of each other, it's not an either or, scripturally speaking, it is a both and. And so often we don't understand each other because the system has pushed us to think that you can only be one or the other. And so what happens to most people is this. People start out with alternate values, and then develop alternate views, and then start consuming alternate news sources, ending up with alternate facts, and the cycle just perpetuates itself. Perpetuates itself and perpetuates itself. And so people get pushed to the ends, to the poles, and don't realize that the reason why you have such little commonality with the people that you're talking to who look different than you is because you have a completely different concept of the world. You see, one solution is that we must be local. Exposure breeds empathy. When you know people who are different than you, when you meet people who don't think like you, when you're around people who look different than you and you realize that you like them, well, then all of a sudden your preconceived notions start to fall away. There's a couple of my friends. We've formed an amazing friendship, and we've learned that We're not so different than we thought once we got to know each other. So we must be local if we want to make any real solutions or make anything different. Second, we must be anti-racist. I love this term and this idea. The idea of being, uh, is that race and racism is more like a peelable name tag than a perpetual identity. It's the idea that you can care but still say something racist or do something racist. It's an ongoing battle. It reminds me of this. Uh, When I was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 years old, I remember like it was yesterday, I was at a bowling alley, and for some reason this joke that I had heard at school popped into my head. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, do you you know know a, a black guy's favorite game? And he looked at me with this like, kid, what are you talking about? Look. And so to try to like kind of get to the punchline, I was like, well, it's bowling, of course. I mean, where else does a black ball get to smash a bunch of white redneck pins? And I started laughing, and he looked at me like, we, he said, 
we don't tell jokes like that. And I said, well, like classic smug kid, you know, how can it be a bad joke if the minority wins the joke? And he said, because if you start laughing at things that group people based on the way that they look, you're eventually, inevitably, going to find your way to something that is really, really wrong and not even realize it. That was a perfect example that I saw when I was a kid. That's what anti-racism does. What anti-racism does is say, we don't divide people based on the way they look ever. Just a couple things, then we're done. We also must be nuanced and reject all either or ideologies in theology, politics, and culture. If we want to make the steps that we want to make, if we want to build the diverse world that we want to, if we want things to be different in the future than they have been in the past, we must reject the idea that things are an either or. Uh, this spring, during the coronavirus epidemic, there was this amazing documentary about the Michael Jordan Bulls that I enjoyed watching The Last Dance like many people. And it was funny how people immediately had to go to the, but who's better, Michael or LeBron? Who's better, Michael, LeBron, or Kobe Bryant? Who's better? Who's better? And it was this idea that in order to enjoy one, you have to pick one over the other. Well, to me, that's like, I'm glad I got to watch Michael in the 90s. I'm glad I got to watch Kobe in the 2000s. And I'm glad I got to watch LeBron in the 2010s. This idea that you have to pick one or the other. You have to be this thing or that thing. You have to be pro-life or pro-civil rights. You have to be pro-business or pro-the government helping people. You have to be pro-this or it's or. And the truth of it is, those are man-made constructs. To actually be what we say we want to be, we have to reject either or and be both and. You see, in closing, this is the world that we're living in today. This is the theology of our day. The theology of our day is community without commitment, faith without discipleship, kingdom without king. What you see people doing all around us is clamoring to make the world more like the way God designed it, but without actually having God as part of it. And these are the things that we must reject. We must re reject this false ideology that we can bring the kingdom, make the world a perfectly just place without the king who made it in the first place. Instead, we must do the both and. We must speak out about injustice wherever we see it and we must listen when our friends who experience it more acutely are talking. We must pray like it all depends on us. We must protest like it all depends on us and pray like it all depends on God. We must lead out with faith saying it must be different while also being willing to learn. You see, so often we get stuck in the either or the both instead of the both and. And if we want things to be different, the white church, if we want this time to be different, if we wanna, instead of being at the back of the justice line, get to the front of the justice line with our brothers and sisters, we must be willing to do the uncomfortable thing of letting others lead, letting others have a voice heard, and supporting and amplifying their voices instead of trying to figure things out for themselves, for ourselves all the time. Here's a couple friends of mine, people that I know, these are voices that I really trust. If I've said anything useful to you in this half an hour, you should go get their books and read them and understand them and understand where they're coming from. These are some voices that I really trust. These are some books that I've read that have made a massive impact on me. There's dozens more that could be helpful. But really, what are we aiming for? We want the kingdom of God to come, and we want it to come soon. And we want this world to reflect the perfect justice of the kingdom of God. And if we're going to do that, we simply must must, 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 must learn to treat our brothers and sisters and create a world in where everyone who has been made in the image of God is treated that way. Until black lives matter, we can't anymore say that we claim to believe that all lives matter. Thank you. So I thought that was an interesting um, idea to put out there. And what I would add is that it's impossible to create what he's suggesting in the religion of Christianity. It has um, roots that are so deep 
I don't know how you'd be able to destroy them. Um, the remnants. It's like the remnants of fascism. I mean, fascism is always going to recycle its way through societies until society doesn't exist anymore. And um, there's going to be a core group of people who are just going to refuse to understand what he was talking about in that video. And that's actually one of the things that I'm most grateful for Donald Trump showing up is that I actually was one of those people who was in constant hope that we would be able to bridge and overcome a lot of the um, ideologies that kind of brought us the pain and suffering that a lot of people have had to undergo through the centuries. And so, um, this is a call from me, not just to black people, but to decent you know, people worldwide to get out of Christianity. If you crush that system, you actually have a, a, a real opportunity to do real change. But as long as people continue to try to reform, you know, like the Democratic and the Republican parties. There's no reformation in that. There's no reformation in the police department. There's no reformation in religion as it stands, you know, today. So as people continue to try to work with a flawed system, then we're going to continue to move in a direction that's going to be detrimental to the planet and to um, life. Not just human life, but life. And so I hope someone can understand, you know, this message. And um, always asking for prayer. And thank you for your time and attention.